It is truly an honor for me to have the opportunity to interview my friend, John Calhoun, a past president and past secretary of the Southern Thoracic Surgical Association. John is a true triple threat cardiothoracic surgeon who is a local, regional, and national leader in our field. After attending the University of Texas at Austin on a scholarship to play golf, John graduated from Baylor College of Medicine in 1981. He then completed a general surgery residency and a thoracic surgery residency at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio with his cardiothoracic training under the mentorship of Dr. Kent Trinkle. John then trained in pediatric cardiac surgery at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School under the mentorship of Aldo Castaneda. Dr. Calhoun then joined the cardiothoracic surgical faculty at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio in 1989. And he, has been on, and he has been a surgeon at the University of Texas Health Science Center ever since for over 30 years. In 1994, he became presser, professor and head of the Division of Cardiothoracic Surgery. And then in 2010, Dr. Calhoun was named founding chairman of the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery. His areas of clinical expertise include congenital heart surgery, adult cardiac surgery, and pulmonary transplantation. John has held leadership roles in almost every cardiothoracic surgical organization. He served as secretary of the Southern Thoracic Surgical Association from 2003 to 2006, and then as president of the Southern Thoracic in 2015. He served on the American Board of Thoracic Surgery from 2003 to 2013, and was the exam chair in 2008, vice chair from 2009 to 2011, and chair of ABTS from 2011 to 2013. John has also served as president of the Thoracic Surgery Foundation and, the pre and as president of the Thoracic Surgery Directors Association. And John is currently the first vice president of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. More importantly, John is a wonderful father, husband, and family man. And John is my friend, a friend who has advised me and helped me navigate some real challenges in my own life. Thank you, John, for all that you do and for all that you have done. I would like to start our chat by discussing the concept of leadership with you. It is, notice, it is notable, John, that you have served, as I said before, as a leader in almost every major cardiothoracic organization. Can you share with us your thoughts on leadership, what makes a good leader, and why is leadership in professional societies important? Jeff, thanks for spending some time with me and, and uh, for speaking with me. Um, you know, leadership is about service. And uh, I, I can say that I really never aspired to any of these national positions that I've been, I guess, fortunate enough to have, but I've always tried to first figure out what does a group need and what can you do to help? Uh, I started at the Southern as the uh, golf tournament committee chair, which was a committee of one. And it was a lot of fun. And uh, from there, every time you get asked to do something, just try and do your best, try and figure out what the guys that you're working for need. And uh, I think that's, that's where leadership comes from is, trying to serve. And if you do a good job, people will ask you to do more. I think that's nicely summarized. Can you tell us a little bit about the importance of the Thoracic Surgery Foundation? And I picked that one out specifically because of your ties with leadership and service. You know, the foundation is uh, one of the places where we give back to our specialty. It has given away well, like 15, 18 million dollars since it was formed. Um, it's helped uh, countless careers. It's uh, been the vehicle for the Brownwald uh, Foundation grant and Dr. Bavaria is doing a great job of getting uh, that, uh, that uh, corpus of money even further solidified. We're hopeful that Dr. Brownwald and his family are going to give some more money. There's been over 40 female surgeons that have benefited from Brownwall uh, career uh, grants or development grants. Uh, and, you know, the foundation's a place where each of us, I got a grant from it to go to the Kennedy School, to the Harvard uh, thing at the Kennedy School. And uh, that was transformational. So it's really helped uh, our society and our specialty grow in terms of developing 
uh, skills and ability to give back to the specialty. Yeah, you know, I've heard uh, many of the leaders in our field like you and John Meyer have really thought and uh, commented about the value of the Kennedy School training. And that clearly is one of the many great things that the Thoracic Surgery Foundation has been able to sponsor. Uh, I was so blessed. Yeah. John Meyer was, was you know, I was in his class is a more appropriate way to say it. Uh, I was one of his residents. I learned from him uh, as much as I learned from Aldo. Uh, yeah, Aldo definitely. created the milieu, but he recruited guys like John Meyer and Richard Jonas. Yeah, and, and John talks a lot about uh, that, that Kennedy School and how transformational it was, just like you said. Now, I'd, I'd, I'd like to take a step back now and talk about your early life a little bit. Maybe you can share with us where you were born, where you were raised, a little bit about your childhood, family, your brother and your sister. Well, it's been a while, but uh, <laughs> I was born well, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I don't really like to admit it, but Tulsa was a great place. Uh, I don't remember much about it. I left when I was two. My dad was a surgery resident in Tulsa, and then he was fortunate enough to get into uh, work with Cameron Haight and, and Herb Sloan at Ann Arbor. And so off to Ann Arbor, I went and went to kindergarten in Ann Arbor and remember coming back to Austin where my dad started his practice. And so in many regards, I was a congenital heart surgeon. You know, I, I wanted to be like my father who was a heart surgeon and loved making rounds with him and doing stuff. And after going through all the usual undergrad st stuff, you know, high school, all that in Austin, I stayed at Texas for a couple of three years. I did have a scholarship. I didn't amount to much. Uh, ended up getting out of college before it got too, too tough. Never got a degree. Went to Baylor. Had a great experience at Baylor Medical School in Houston. And then came here and uh, have been here ever since. And you, you've talked a little bit about your brother and sister with me. You want to tell us a little bit about your family growing up? Sure. Uh, I was the oldest. <clears throat> My brother is a... Uh, Real estate developer in Austin has been uh, fiscally extremely successful. That's one of his goals. He's a really brilliant, great young man. My sister uh, is a much more kind of a liberal arts, uh, touchy-feely person <laughs> than I was as a kid growing up, although I'm catching up to her now. She lives in Paris, France. Uh, she's a, a French and American citizen, speaks French fluently, has an interior design business in Paris now couple of grown kids. That's great. And now let's let's move on and talk a little bit about your own family. Um, I, I've been lucky enough to have the chance to visit at your house and, and uh, meet your wife, your kids. Tell us a little bit about your wife and kids. Well, um, I didn't get married until I was a fair amount older and Sarah was pretty young. Um, not long after we got married, she decided she was going to be a news anchor. And I went, oh my God, dated news anchors, they're always working. She's great. Uh, we've been together 30 years. This will be our 28th uh, anniversary this year. I still think we're going to make it. Uh, she, uh, she retired as a news anchor about three years ago and is busy doing a lot of other things. Uh, I like to tell everybody I'm, I'm on my second family with my only wife. Uh, we've got two older boys that are 20 and 22. And then we've got a daughter, Sevy, who's nine and a boy who's seven named Stretch that, that are coming along. The older kids are, they're great. They don't much care for college, but uh, they're doing well. They're off the payroll by and large and uh, gamefully employed. Uh, one of them doing uh, some uh, car repair stuff that he likes. And I think he'll maybe make that a career. He loves cars. And the other one is working right now and kind of just sorting out things. I think he's going to head back to college. Well, you know, I, I've met your family and uh, I, I gotten to see your beautiful home. We, uh, w when, I, when I visited your house, I got to see a little bit about some of your hobbies. And I think sharing about these hobbies with the group would be uh, appreciated by many. Maybe tell us a little bit about your hobbies and how that plays out in your house. Well, I mean, I think all of us as surgeons uh, like to do things with our hands. And my father loved to do things with his hands and I either inherited or more likely, uh, you know, imitated, emulated that. So I have a workshop that's pretty good, decent size uh, that's attached to the house. It was part of why we built that house 20 years ago. And I'm a pretty good welder now, TIG and MIG and been working on 
uh, a car frame every now and then. I'm a pretty proficient woodworker. I'm, I'm slow, but I'm, I'm probably better than average. And I've ended up making just about every piece of furniture in the house. And the sconces in the living room are made out of metal. The dining room tables, metal and wood. Um, redid the whole cabinets in the in the kitchen and and uh, redid the cabinet top out of some African black walnut that's really pretty. I hate to paint, just <laughs> I'm not a big painter, but I love fixing things and making things, and it takes our mind off of some of the stuff we do otherwise. Yeah, when when I was at your home, your children took great pleasure in so showing me some secret passageways in the house. Yeah, That's... we have a few of those. Uh, there's a wine cellar you don't quite see, and we put in a Star Trek door to one of the rooms that goes up and down when you wave your hand in front of it, which was fun to install and, and a lot to, of engineering to figure out, but a lot of fun. Well, I, I think that's great. I think... Um... There may not be many past presidents of the Southern Thoracic that have a Star Trek room in their house. So yeah, well, I'm glad we could uh, expose that during this uh, interview. That's some, that's pretty cool. Thank you. But what, what drew you to medicine and then what drew you to cardiothoracic surgery? You know, for me, it was really easy. I, I really uh, admired my dad, liked to go make rounds. And it, it's the joy of what we get to do every day. I just made rounds before I came over here and I, Saw a guy we're going to operate on tomorrow. I saw a lady we did yesterday that's doing fine. Looked at some of the kids that are up getting better. I love interacting with patients and with families. I love interacting with the residents and both trying to teach them and learn from them. Um, and it's just fun. And so watching my dad, uh, he always told me that if a guy didn't whisper when he walked out of the room, isn't that guy great? Isn't he wonderful? He said he needed to go back in there and talk to him some more to make sure that he'd connected and that they were comfortable. And uh, I think that's kind of how I like to do it. It was, you know, the respect that, that uh, he received from every member of the community he worked on when you go to church or you go to, you know, some gathering, everybody be, oh, it's Dr. So-and-so. You know, that's, I guess, the, the narcissistic part of me that likes people to like what you do and respect what you do. And so that's a component of it, but the service part's the real thing. Um, being a golf pro is great, and there are a lot of great golf pros, but it's it's hard for me to see if I'd uh, become a professional golfer, how I would help society as much as a heart surgeon like you helps society by literally keeping thousands of kids alive during your career. Well, I, I think that your thoughts on the value of the relationship between the doctor and the patient really summarize what it's all about and why many of us have chosen to go the way that we have. Tell us a little bit about your mentors and how they shape your career choices. Well, one of them is Uncle Freddie. And so Fred Grover, uh, who's past president of everything, uh, was just a wonderful teacher and you never quite understood how much he was teaching you until he's not with you anymore. And I, I still talk to him every now and then in Colorado and every now and then he'll call me up with a, well, what do you think about this or that? And you know, pretty soon you figure out he's suggesting to you, maybe there's other ways. So he's a great teacher and a great mentor, learned a lot from him administratively, learned a lot from him about people. Uh, he's a wonderful father. People don't know he's a member of the Silver Beaver Award which is the highest award you can get for the scouts. Um, and both of Fred's kids were Eagle Scouts. And anybody who has Eagle Scout kids means their father was an Eagle Scout father or mother. I wasn't, and that's something I regret. So Fred was great. Dr. Trinkle, anybody who talks to me know that I always say something Dr. Trinkle said every two seconds. I learned a ton from Dr. Trinkle, really became uh, arguably his best friend. Uh, I put him to sleep when he passed away and uh, uh, can't overestimate how much he taught me, but my father's right up there with him. So a lot, of, a lot of people. Well, I, you know, those are just really icons in our field. 
I did not personally know Dr. Trinkle, but obviously I've heard amazing things about him. And I would agree, Dr. Grover is uh, the surgeon's surgeon. I've had the pleasure of talking with, with, with Dr. Grover a lot about the Boy Scouts as well. My son's an Eagle Scout. What you said is right. It's a tribute. Uh, yeah, it, I, I think about my son's Eagle Scout as a tribute to my wife in a lot of ways and the amount of the huge amount of work she did in scouting to bring my son along. And I got to do the fun things like go on the great campouts. It's one thing about Fred that people don't know. I'm a chief resident. We did four kids the year I was chief resident here in San Antonio. We, we didn't do very many. One of them was a three kilo, one day old, obstructed veins that was sicker in hell. The yep. old, tired, adult cardiac surgeon, Fred Grover, put that kid back together, did beautiful. That kid lived and did fine. So it was pretty amazing that uh, 34 years ago, or 33, that Fred could do a total veins in a place that didn't do them, that didn't really have a good PDICU. Get that kid through it and get that kid well. He was really technically taught us a lot. Yeah, that, that's what, what a wonderful mentor, somebody who's a great surgeon, a great technician, and a great human being. I'd like to now move towards some thoughts towards the future. And for starters, I wanted to ask you, what are your thoughts about how the cardiothoracic surgical and even the congenital cardiothoracic surgical landscape has changed over the past 10 years? And where do you see it going in the next 10 years? Well, it's changed tremendously from when we started and it continues to evolve at, at seemingly ever increasing speed. Uh, and if we go back to what we talked to a little bit earlier about the doctor patient relationship, the value that we bring, we need to focus on that. Uh, in particular, uh, it's my notion that, that uh, we don't know what, what we're gonna be in five or 10 years. We don't know where we're gonna be. We don't know what's gonna evolve in terms of the care of the patient, but we must never lose sight of the fact that we're entrusted with improving the health of cardiac and thoracic patients. And our goal should not be to prove necessarily that our heart surgery is the best and to denigrate stents or medical therapy. Our goal should, goal should be to work with our colleagues in a heart team or a lung team or an esophagus foregut team is what's the best therapy for that patient and to continue to be a part of that and to chase that. Um, I think if we do that, we're gonna be fine. And it may be that, that cabbage as we know it's gonna change, but I'm, I'm looking at guidelines coming out right now, just like everybody else is. We, we can't stand idly by and let people cancel us because they're a bigger specialty. You, you and I both know that if we go down and have a tight LAD, that I'll take a two month vacation, slap a mammary on me. I want to be around 20 more years. And I don't want a stent gumbing up my, my proximal LAD, at least yeah, the stents we have today. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Put me on bypass, cross clamp my aorta, stop my heart and sew my mammary on my LAD perfectly. That's what yeah. I want. Yeah, one of my partners says probably the most important event in a person's life is the construction of the Lima anastomosis to the LAD. Oh yeah, yeah, and do it perfect. Do it on a non-moving heart. And uh, that's what I want if I ever have to have that done. I agree. Well, do it 100%. perfect. I don't want to slam anybody like Puskas that can do them really well without a pump. <laughs> but, uh, that's right. For God's sake, do it right. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'd like to wrap up with a couple of last questions. First of all, what advice would you give to today's cardiothoracic surgery residents? Um, just enjoy the ride. Uh, it, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and I think the mantra that, that I've tried to adopt is to keep trying to get better, try and be really good at getting better every day. Keep an open mind, think of the consequences, the unintended consequences, what's going on. Think of what your boss wants. If you do that, if you're always thinking about what the guy or gal above you wants, you end up being a really good resident, you end up contributing to the team, you end up having a good time, you end up being respected, uh, and you learn a bunch along the way. So just be the best you can at getting better. I think that's some solid advice. Let's finish um, by asking you to share one or two of your favorite memories of the Southern Thoracic Annual Meetings. I'm looking forward to this question particularly. Well, 
I hope Ungerleiter's out there because uh, he and I skipped out on some dinner. I forget where it was in Florida, but there was a putting green next to the golf, to the hotel. And we had liquor service and we putted well into the night, probably two o'clock in the morning. And uh, we couldn't see the hole very well, but I'm not sure it was because of just the darkness. So <laughs> Ross and I had a great time getting to know each other and just, you know, putting for pesos out there by the hotel. A couple other things. One was uh, in, uh, in Cancun. Uh, I think I was secretary of the meeting. And I did a couple of things that were fun. One, our dear friend Mafrutis was given the Ulster Abbott Award. Oh, boy. And I, uh, despite all of his efforts, was able to get a hold of his slides and rearrange them. And uh, <laughs> it threw his whole talk off, and I've never seen him so discombobulated. And shortly <laughs> thereafter, I gave the golf awards, and uh, I gave the long drive award to Dr. Cooley, who, at his age, clearly hit the ball further than anybody else would have been a risk adjusted model. Sure. And uh, I like when I called him up there in his tuxedo and he stood up and recovered from being singled out, I asked him if he couldn't get us a urine test too, just to verify the veracity <laughs> of the award. And so those sure. were some fun things. The Southern's a great place. I have a ton of great memories about the Southern. One other, if, if people want to listen. Oh, yeah. Ronnie. Oh boy. Playing golf with Myron Baumgartner and Thrani was the Ulster Abbott award winner that year. So he had to put together the Ulster Abbott award function for that night. And as is the case, we always would call ahead and order drinks and hors d'oeuvres to the room. So I called and ordered several hundred dollars worth of champagne and shrimp to Thrani's room and pretended to be him. And unbeknownst to me, Dr. Urschel did the same thing. So Thrani had a way over thousand dollar bill and he still remembers that, and I still remember it so fondly. It was the least we could do for him. <laughs> well, I, I just love it. Hearing these stories, it, it reminds me the value of the special organization we have in the Southern Thoracic. Uh, when I hear names like Hal Urschel and Surf and Ungerleiter and Mabrutus and Thorani, it just makes me smile. Yeah. And, you know, we, we have a special, special group of people and a special, special association in the Southern. John, it's been a real honor to interview you for the Southern. Uh, you bring flavor to the Southern. You bring character to the Southern. And most importantly, you're a great surgeon. You're a great surgeon. You're a great leader. And, and you're my friend. And I got to know you through the Southern. And every day, Stacy and I are so happy that you're our friends. So thank you for doing this interview. Uh, I hope that the people out there in cyberspace who watch it enjoy it. I'm fairly certain that they will. Uh, I've learned a lot, and uh, I'm sure that everybody who listens to this is going to enjoy hearing your important insights. So thank you very much, and thank you for all the great things that you do for our profession. Thanks, Jeff. It's a pleasure. Everybody be good. Be safe. Right. Thank, thank you. you.